All right, so this is thermal energy, and for once, I'm starting this class with the group ones where they are not sitting down paying attention. So group twos, you are a special group. You finally get to witness something like this. So this is the last section that we are doing in this unit. It is all about thermal energy. So this is going to do a lot with repeating what was done in previous sections. So here we go. So thermal energy is uh, slightly different than temperature. Now you need to know what the difference between these two things are. And then thermal energy and what we're talking about today is dealing with the total kinetic and stored energy of an object or within an object. That would be great, yes. As opposed to temperature, which is the average kinetic energy. So the key things to note in the difference between these two, total, average. Total and average. So these two things are different. So when we talk about something having heat, you probably would think that has to do with temperature, and they're sort of related to each other, but they are different. And I'll show you in an example on the next slide once you guys are done writing this one up. What's that? The day has been going pretty good so far. Today's a, today's a full teaching day, which is always a lot. Does anyone find they get headaches at the end of the day by having their mask on all the time? Yeah. Yeah. On the bus ride home, I feel very claustrophobic. All right, is anyone still writing this out? Home lines? Okay. Yes, because hitting an object always makes it work better. Okay, if you don't have it written down, I can come back to it. So here's the question. I've got two objects here. I've got a pot of boiling water and I've got an iceberg. Which of these contains more heat? The iceberg? How many of you would say the iceberg has more heat? Two, three. How many of you would say that the boiling pot of water has more heat? Okay, a few more people. How many of you think they're equal? No, they're separated. Notice one picture, another picture. Well, take a look at your definition of heat. What does the, the definition of heat say? The total stored energy. So if I were to take every single particle that's in my boiling pot of water, so you guys know H2O, H2O you know that it's conformed, com, conformed from that, um, and take all the total energy of that, and then look at the total energy of every single molecule in this iceberg. If I were to add them all together, the iceberg would definitely be higher. So in terms of heat, the iceberg has way more heat. And that's just due to the fact that it has a lot more particles. If I were to talk about which of these two has the bigger temperature, then it's boiling water. What, what temperature does water boil at? 100 degrees. What temperature does water freeze at? Zero. So I know the temperature of this because it's the average amount of energy to, with this, and I know the average temperature of that. So this is the difference between those. Average, I can talk about temperature. But if I look at the total kinetic energy, if I take all the particles, this one wins. Does that make sense? So it's just due to the sheer volume that the iceberg wins. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so in your notes there, uh, which contains more heat, you'd put the iceberg in the top right. And why so many particles? So again, the box top right, uh, which contains more heat? It's the iceberg. Underneath why, there are so many particles. Okay, so let's look at chemistry a little bit. So if you don't like chemistry, I'm gonna show you a little bit of it. Um, and chemistry is really just a small portion of physics, just like physics is a small portion of math, and math is a small portion of philosophy. So technically we're all just philosophers while going through all of this. So if I were to look at a solid, how would you describe what the particles look like? So, you're very close. It's not that they're entangled. Yeah, so they're packed in tight, right? Your hand doesn't pass through a table. At least most times it won't. So, if I were to look at the particles, it would look something like this. They're all nicely compact. Yeah. So, this is what they do. There's going to be a little bit of vibration between them, because technically no particle is at, um, has no movement. That would be absolute zero, which we have not achieved yet. So this is what they look like. There's a bit of vibration, not a lot. If I were to then look at a liquid, how would this change? They're going to be a bit farther away, yeah. It's not that they're going to go through each other, because remember, these are still... Yeah, yeah. So if I looked at a liquid, say they're going to be a little bit more spaced out. They're not this spaced out, but they're going to look like this with... They're going to move around a little bit. Yep. It's called Brownian motion, if you learned that. So they move around... What's that? Okay. So this is liquid. Okay, there's particles. They're somewhat still close together, and they're still moving. Yeah? Uh, no, this is still liquid. I'm going to get to gas. So, so what, Mohammed, what does the gas look like? Hmm? Yeah, so it still is like this. Like there's, there's, mo I'm not drawing every single particle. Just like here, I didn't fill out the whole space. Okay, yeah. So there's still other circles in here. They're still moving around. Whereas gases, they're very spaced apart. They can potentially be moving a lot bigger velocities. Again, moving out at random positions, but they're a lot more spaced out. So with a gas, like what's in the air right now, you can pass anything solid through it, it moves pretty easily. A liquid, there's a little bit more resistance, because there's a little bit, the particles are more compact, but you can still pass something through that. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, that is a good question, I don't know. I know what you're talking about, but I don't, I haven't seen a diagram of it. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that would look like. So this is what we're dealing with. So if I'm looking at, say, the temperature or the energy to get the heat of these objects, which of these three things has the greatest amount of kinetic energy? Well, if we're looking at, kin if we're looking at kinetic energy, kinetic energy has to do with what? With movement. So, so I need to look at which one has the most movement. It's going to be the gas. If I were to... Um, no, I already talked about that. So that, that's essentially what this is talking about. It's just saying that um, this is the, how the particles look. So if I'm looking at the total energy, if I'm looking at the heat, I take what's the kinetic energy of this particle plus the kinetic energy of this 
plus the kinetic energy of this, I add them all up. Same thing for the liquid, I add those all up, solid, add them up. You're going to get some total heat. So this is basically a summary of what I said. When a material is heated, the particles move faster and they will expand. It's different for different, um, different materials as to what, um, what temperature they change at. Have any of you ever heard of liquid nitrogen? Yes. Have any of you, I don't think they have that here. But have you ever? Yeah, that's not not good. You should you shouldn't eat it. Yeah, no, that's that's something different. That's what we did in university. What did you? Fire extinguisher. Oh yeah, dry dry ice is a little bit different than liquid nitrogen. But yes. Um, yeah, because liquid nitrogen, it's, so it turns into a gas at room temperature. So you'd have to keep it really cold. I remember a few years back we went to, I think it was, it was either AUC or GUC, and they had, they had liquid nitrogen. And so they could show, they had like a cup full of it. It had the steam going out, and you can pour it on the ground, and then it just evaporates. Really? Mm -hmm. It's it's pretty cool. In university, I had a professor, and we were dealing with that for one of our experiments. And one of the students came late to class, and so our teacher had a, a cup full of it, and then he like went like this and poured it into on his shirt, and then, of course it evaporated before he got there. But he freaked out a little bit. Okay, um, this is. Not really something you fully need to know. What you need to, to take from this diagram that's on your sheet, the temperature that ice melts, or the transition points, at zero and 100. These are really the key points that you need to know, is your melting point, or the uh, solidifying point, and the conversion between steam and water, or liquid and gas. So if you don't know those points at 100 or 0, you need to learn those. Okay, I'm going to expect that this is common knowledge. You'll need to know that. That's really the main thing with this chart that you need to recognize. I would assume that that's general knowledge, but I've assumed other things are general knowledge and been incorrect. So I'm just stating those. And there is points to put, if an object heated, it does two things, change temperature or change state. And you guys know what the term state means, right, in this case? So like solid is a state, liquid is a state, gas is a state. Just to confuse you, if a scientist ever talks about fluids, fluids relate to liquids and gases, just to mess with your brains. I don't know why, because they behave different than solids. OK, these three things, four things, three things. So I want you to write these out, and then I will, go, I will explain them. So write out conduction, convection, and radiation, and leave space beside it. Don't draw the pictures. I'm going to tell you the definitions of each of those. Just write out each of those at first. So these are the three ways that heat gets transferred. And you've experienced all three of these, I'm pretty sure. The first one, conduction. So conduction is when heat gets transferred through contact. So in beside uh, conduction on your piece of paper, write um, contact or something about it transferring through contact. 
So I don't know who is the engineer who designs pots and pans for kitchens, but whoever designed a pot with metal handles is an idiot. Because have you ever tried to carry a pot that is just boiled and it has metal handles? Yes. It's very dumb. I don't know who thought of that because metals conduct heat very easily. Same thing, or if you put a spoon in your hot chocolate and you're spinning it around and you leave it for a bit, the spoon gets hot. So that's conduction, that's this one here. So you've got a fire. The temperature change indicates that it's changing temperature. So you've probably seen that before. If something turns orange or red, it's, it's changing its temperature. And if you ever go on with physics and you talk about thermodynamics, you talk about black body radiation, which talks about different colors are certain temperatures. So you can actually figure out what those are. That's conduction. Convection is a little bit different. So this is, um, this is through the movement of fluid. And so this is why I needed to tell you the definition of fluid. So beside convection, you'd put movement of fluid. And again, fluid is either a gas or a liquid. So this is if you put your hands above a fire, you're going to feel the heat of the flames. You're not actually touching something, it's just the gas and the steam rising, you will feel that. Or, um, what would be another case? If any of you ever put, uh, or try to empty out the dishwasher, once the dishwasher is done, when you open the door of it, if you're wearing glasses, your glasses all fog up. It's, and you feel the heat from that. Or if you're in a, in a sauna, so you go into a sauna, you feel the heat due to this convection. Radiation is similar, except it's not transferred through any particles. So radiation, um, can, these look similar. Convection is through fluids. So steam uh, as a gas or as liquid, Whereas radiation, it requires no medium. Do you know what I mean by medium? So a medium is something that it's transferred through. So um, right now in me talking to you, my sound travels through the medium of air. Or here the medium is metal. Here the medium is air. So radiation transfers through nothing. So this would be when you're outside, you feel warm from the sun because the sun radiates heat. It doesn't need to travel through anything. I mean, it travels through our atmosphere, but in between the sun and the earth, there's no medium. It's just empty space. So radiation is transferred through um, no medium. So for this one, just write no medium required. And by medium, I mean, it's written like this, no medium required. So heat will always transfer. It's always gonna flow through the metal or escape from the fire or radiate away from it until you've got thermal equilibrium. So we've, did I talk to you about equilibrium at all for anything? I might've mentioned it. Equilibrium just means everything's equal. So for instance, um, if I've got the AC on in the back. So the AC, the, the cold air is going to seep into the rest of the room until the whole room is the same temperature. Then it has nowhere to flow. So it's the same thing with this. As soon as this piece of metal is the same temperature, heat doesn't flow because it's already all equal until you add some more heat to it. So that's what it means. Once, once everything is the equal temperature, it stops. Questions with this? So now we'll get into the math portion of this. <clears throat> so here's your equation. Change in EH, so this is just change in energy, which is heat energy. This is equal to MC delta T. You might have seen this in chemistry. Did any of you take this in chemistry? Maybe you'll take it next year, I'm not sure. 
Um, with this, you will also see this written as Q. So just in your notes here, also write Q because this will also show up at some point, whether in your formula sheets, I think I put EH. Yeah, I put EH on here. You might easily see this as a Q as well. I don't know why they picked Q, they just did. So change in EH is your change in thermal energy. Again, you can call this Q. And mass, M is mass, that one's pretty straightforward. Specific heat capacity is a constant value depending on the object. So just like your coefficient of friction or your what else? It's a constant depending on what, what, um, what object you're dealing with. And then T is change in temperature. So specific heat capacity, there's a table full of all of these things that you can fill out. Um, there's one on your formula sheet on the back side. There's a whole bunch of specific heat capacities on the back of the formula sheet talking about air at sea level, air in room conditions, aluminum, animal tissue, copper, diamond, ethanol. So scientists have just done a lot of calculations with this to figure out the specific heat capacities. I'll wait a second until you guys write that out. Don't forget to include the units. The units are nice to have. So the specific heat capacity, uh, actually let's, let's jump back a sec. So if I were to talk about coefficient of friction, so go back way into dynamics. If I had an object that has a large coefficient of friction, what does that tell you about the force of friction? So think about coefficient of friction. If I say that rubber has a high coefficient of friction, what does that tell you about that object? No, not due to heat. Energy. Think about friction. It has a lot more friction. So the higher, this, the higher the coefficient of friction, the greater the friction. Right? If I take a block of ice and rub it on the table, it's going to have a low amount of friction, so it's a low coefficient of friction. It's a similar thing with specific heat capacity. So the more specific heat capacity I have, the more amount of energy I need to put into an object to change its temperature. So if we were to look at some examples here, so water, carbon, iron, copper, lead. I don't know if this table is filled out on your box. You haven't? Okay, perfect. So I don't have to wait for it. So looking at this, I need to put into water a lot more energy to change the temperature than I do lead. So if I heat up lead, it's going to heat up very quickly. So notice your metals get hot really quick. That's why they're used for pots, pans, stuff like that, because you don't have to wait forever for it to change temperature. Whereas water is a great, um, it's great at keeping things the same temperature. So water doesn't change very easily. So even when you, so any of you who went to the beach last week for your holidays, any of you dare to go into the water? If it, if it was not a heated pool? Yeah, so, the, so the, your, the sea was quite cold, right? Even though the air around it's really hot. And that's because the air has a lower specific heat capacity than the water. So it takes longer for that water to heat up. That's why your water still stays cold. Yeah, so if I wanted to conduct heat, this would be where I'd pick it. Yeah, exactly. For what? Um, it also has to deal with 
um, if they're good at sharing electrons. So often stuff like this is used for yeah, for electricity stuff because you can transfer electrons a lot easier, which has to do more with its uh, composition with electrons and how whether they share them easily. So there's when so if you think about creating technology, you want something that doesn't heat up too fast because if it does, your your circuit board's going to get fried. But yet you also need to make sure that it shares electrons pretty quickly. Or think about um, think about light bulbs. So with light bulbs as well, you can think about, okay, light bulbs get hot. That's because it takes a certain amount of energy to heat it up. So the less energy you lose to heat, the better the, um, the, better the object. So let's try an example. So let's say Mr. Trask, who is the very kind and generous teacher that I've gotten this from, he makes a cup of coffee, coffee by boiling 250 grams of water. It's initially at 15 degrees Celsius. We want to know how much is needed in order to do that. So we've got our equation, Q equals MC delta T, capital T for temperature. I've got everything for this. So what's the mass of the water I'm boiling? Okay, but notice, good, yeah, it's in grams, so I need to put it as 0 0.25, so divide it by 1,000. What is the specific heat capacity of water? 4,180. Good. So I'm not, often I will not give you that, so you need to be aware it's on your formula sheet. And my change in temperature. So if I'm changing in temperature, it's final minus initial. So it's not just 15. Notice it's change in temperature, not just temperature. So this is why I said you need to know the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water. So if I'm going to boil it, my final temperature is 100 and my initial is 15. So it's going to be 85, yeah. So calculate this. And if you round it, you'll get 89,000 joules. So this is the little trick with heat. Again, change in temperature, not just temperature. I need to deal with what's the change. If there's no change, there's no heat. Any questions with this? Okay. Let's do one more that is a very common question. This is basically a summary of everything in the entire unit. Almost. I would just need to throw an efficiency in there and then it would be everything. So here's the situation we've got. We've got a child that's going down a slide. We're told the initial speed. Uh, is at rest, we're told the final speed, we're told, what else? The slide is made of 12 kilograms of iron, all the heat is transferred to the slide, we want to know how much does the temperature of the slide increase. Okay, so this is a lot. What this is, is it is a conservation of energy question. So we've got our kid is on a slide Uh, we're told the height of the slide. We're told this is 3.2. We are told, what's the V initial? Zero. You're at rest. And we're told at the bottom here, our final velocity is 1.8. Should be in there. What else do we know? We got two masses. We've got the mass of the kid and the mass of the slide. Okay, we'll get to that in a sec. So, because this is a um, conservation of energy problem, 
we've got EI is equal to EF. So energy initial is equal to energy final. This must be the case. Now, in the past, we've talked about this being totally conserved. We don't lose any energy. But in this case, the child is going to lose some energy as they go down the slide. And that energy doesn't just disappear, it gets transformed into heat in the slide. So what I'm going to do for this, and there's a formula on your formula sheet that, that has this, is we're going to do this equation. So energy uh, potential initial plus EKI equals EPF plus EKF plus EH. So my child is going to lose heat, but it's going to turn into, or it's going to lose energy, which turns into heat. Equals EPF plus EKF plus EH. So I'm just adding one thing, yep. So I'm not losing energy, it's just getting converted to a different type. And then from here we can look at, is there anything convenient I can cancel out? So are there any of these energies that I know is zero? Yeah, I'm starting at rest. Good, so because I started zero speed, here, H, H for heat. And because we're going to pick the bottom of our slide here as our EP equals zero, the potential energy final is zero. A question like this is definitely coming on your test, just so you know. I think on every single version I've made of this test, it's on there. So just so you know it's coming. Uh, something like this. Something like that, yeah. Some situation where you've got conservation of energy with heat loss. What's that? No, because I'm teaching it to you. How's that a bonus? <laughs> How do you, there was a, so why are you complaining? You knew what it was. <laughs> Okay, so here is our expanded equation, but I want you to be very, very careful with how you write this out. So notice, the way I've written it out, all the masses could cancel, but this is not true. So this is why you need to be very careful how you write it out. If I'm looking at the initial potential energy, which object is this? The child. So this is the mass of the child. The pot or the kinetic energy final. What, what object is this talking about? The child. The child is the one that's moving. The slide won't move in this case. So this is the mass of the kid. What changes heat? Heat energy. The slide. So this is the mass. No, because every term needs to have the same thing. Uh, I, I'm telling you that all the heat is transferred to the slide. So yes, technically the kid's bum will heat up, but we're not going to talk about that. Yeah, any of you, do you guys, do you guys have the playgrounds here where it has like that fire pole where you slide down it? Yeah, yeah and then, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where you feel like you lose a layer of skin when you go down it? Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we've got everything we need for this. So we want to know what the temperature increase is. 
I have that. That's what I'm looking for. Do I have the mass of the child? Yes. Yeah. Do I have G? Yes. Height initial? Yes. Uh, you, we said the S. VF? Yes. Mass of the, mass of the slide? Yes. Do I have the specific heat capacity? Yes. You sure? No. What's the slide made of? Oh, yeah. It's made of iron. Oh, good. So we got everything. The what, sorry? This is what we're looking for. We're looking for how much does the temperature increase. So let's plug in numbers. Uh, what's VF? 1.8. Don't forget to square your velocity. I'm still guaranteed I'll catch a few of you who do that. Um, what did you say the specific heat of this? 460, yep. Thank you. 460. <laughs> if this freaks you out, wait till physics 12. Why on that? So this is a summary of everything in the unit. It needs to be big in order to summarize everything. You should be able to, in theory. So plug all this in, solve it. And here's your change in temperature. 0 0.19, yep. So, does this answer make sense? No, yes. A bit, it's not like we get... If, if, you, if you go down a slide, do you think it's going to change the temperature of the slide very much? No. No, definitely not. So it makes sense. That is the entire energy unit. All like that. Which part? Multiply, subtract, divide. Yeah. Any other questions on this?